Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Callan Steinman. I'm curator of education here at the Georgia Museum of Art. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's faculty perspectives program with Dr. Dana Boltman. Before we hear from Dr. Boltman, I'm going to hand things over to Nelda Damiano, who is our Pierre Dara curator of European art. And she's going to share a little bit about the exhibition Power and Piety in 17th Century Spanish Art, which is the inspiration for today's program. Over to you, Nelda. Yes, okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Callan. So uh, I'm really eager to hear uh, Professor Boltman's lecture, so I'm not gonna say much. The only thing I wanted to say was this presentation, the exhibition is in collaboration with the Museum and Gallery at Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina. And this is uh, our second collaboration with uh, Bob Jones in the last Two years. So initially we had a drama and a devotion in Baroque Rome, and now we've moved on to power and piety in Spain. So we just went from Italy to Spain. And so we're very happy, we're very grateful for their generous support for lending these wonderful works. There are six works and they're um, quite focused, of course, in the 17th century, and Professor Boltman will talk a little bit more about it, but I just wanted to say that it will run until November 2020. What year are we? Uh, 22, I think. <laughs> We're in 21, that's right. Okay, I'm sorry. Until November 2021, because we opened this last November 2020. And so you hopefully you'll have a chance to come on the campus and see it in person. But again, we're very thrilled with this collaboration and uh, we're doing this because their collection right now is in storage, most of it, because they are building a new museum and they're very generous in allowing other museums to have access to this collection. And hopefully uh, there will be a third collaboration. And so I'll leave it to, I think, Callan, you were gonna introduce Professor Baltman. That's right. Thank you, Nelda. Sure. Um, so, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Dana Boltman, um, is Professor of Spanish in the Department of Romance Languages at UGA. Dr. Boltman's area of specialty is the literature and culture of Spain pre-1800, or early modern cultural history of the Spanish Golden Age, with a focus on concepts of human nature, interfaces between uh, theological and literary texts, changing conventions of gender and social class, and relationships between genres of writing. Uh, most recently, Dr. Boltman has edited uh, Francisco de Osuna's Norte de, de los Estados in, in Modernized Spanish, A Practical Guide to Conjugal Life in 16th Century Europe, which was published in December 2019. And she's currently a book review editor for Calliope, which is a journal of the Society for Renaissance and Baroque Hispanic Poetry. So I'm so excited to hear Dr. Boltman's perspective on our exhibition through the lens of her expertise in Spanish literature and cultural history. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dana Boltman. Thank you so much, Callan. I'm going to start by sharing uh, my PowerPoint with all of you. So it'll take me a moment to pull it up on screen and to start the slideshow, um, but I hope that you can see it. And uh, hello, everyone. And it's really a delight to be Zooming with you and to have the chance to view this exhibition, which has been so expertly curated by Dr. Nelda Damiano and Julia Kilgore. It's really a fantastic selection of artworks that immerses us in Spanish Counter-Reformation painting. So these are images of all of the paintings we will see, and I'll share them individually on screen as we go along so that we can have the sense of being in the gallery together and contemplating them. So just a few words before we get to the first painting. Martin Luther's and Henry VIII of England's and John Calvin's breaks with the Catholic Church and the rise of Protestant faiths in the early 16th century prompted the Vatican to convene the Council of Trent in 1545. And after 18 years of discussion at Trent, the Catholic Church consolidated its counter-reformation stance. This redefinition of Catholicism was fully articulated in 1566 in Rome's new Tridentine Catechism, which instructed everyone down to parish priests what to say, how to say it, uh, from the pulpit and in the confessional. 
So a key thing to keep in mind about the Spanish context is that before the middle of the 16th century, theological opinions and spiritual practices uh, were varied and fluid. And in fact, for a brief time until the 1540s, Lutheran ideas circulated openly in Spain and they intersected with the critical thinking of many reform-minded clergy in the country, particularly within the Franciscan order. And these Spanish reformers denounced corruption and hypocrisy among the powerful, including within their own ranks. So adherence to Protestant faiths was growing for decades before these Tridentine tenets fully permeated Spanish society in the 17th century. And in addition to trying to compete with the attractions of Protestantism, the Counter-Reformation campaign in art was an answer to the considerable cultural influence that reform-minded Catholics also had as a minority within Spain. So the paintings in the exhibition were produced at the height of Baroque visual art. And chronologically, the first painting in the exhibition is by Pedro Orrente from 1610. And as Protestant Europe became more polarized, we could say that in Spain, there were two postures that characterized spirituality. One, which was sure of humanity's centrality in a material universe that was becoming progressively more separated from a divine sphere far away from human affairs, but still supreme. And another, which was an attempt to personalize God in the figure of a very human Jesus, making the sacred accessible in everyday life, and even in one's own body and emotions, to the point of popularizing mysticism. So that we can really say that a direct, a desire for a direct experience of God became a kind of social phenomenon. So we can look together for evidence of these two different postures when we're viewing this painting by Orrente uh, Ecce Homo, which depicts the New Testament scene in which the Roman Pontius Pilate presents Jesus wearing a crown of thorns to this crowd of onlookers. So the movement and perspective place the viewer at the foot of the scene where perhaps we glance from Jesus's shaded face to his lighted shoulder and the lighted faces of the shoulders of the infants and women. The sensorial effect is lively, noisy even, and comparative. And the impact on our feelings, I think derives from the deep contrast between the emotional states of the figures and the tenderness in some parts of the painting, which contrasts with what is overall a disturbing scene. So this is a, a theatrical representation meant to transport us and make us think and feel. Now, to give you some context, when the painter Orrente was born and grew up, it was in the wake of a great sea change in Spanish society, which had been caused by the monarchy's radical persecution of Spanish Jews and Muslims, who were expelled or forced to convert to Christianity from the time of Queen Isabel and King Ferdinand. So the result was widespread suffering and diaspora, but also an enrichment of popular Catholic devotion through the presence of the so-called new Christians who remained in Spain. So this made the 16th century the era of, of uh, the famed Spanish mystics, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, who were friends and both were poets and also controversial reformers of the discalced Carmelite order. Uh, Teresa was descended from Jewish converts and John's mother and father had Muslim and Jewish ancestors. And so, and at the time that this painting was produced, their mystical writings were widely known in Spain. Um, they taught a form of, of meditative uh, contemplation that came out of the medieval Franciscan practice of recollection and this was an interior form of prayer based on metaphors such as the mystical marriage of the soul with Christ as bridegroom or the human heart as a nest in which the Holy Spirit could alight as a bird. So this mixing of divine and earthly experience in the body is really characteristic of Baroque art and literature of the period. The lives of these mystics and the, and 
Orente and the second painter, Herrera, also overlapped with that of the soldier and author Miguel de Cervantes, who in 1615 had published the second part of his comic novel, Don Quixote, in which he, he barely touched on the topic of religion. Uh, so rather Cervantes avoided it almost, almost altogether and thus also the Inquisition and its censorship. In the novel at one point in their adventures, Don Quixote recites this proverb to his squire. He says, Sancho, we've bumped into the church. And this signifies coming to a dead end or a final authority or an insurmountable obstacle. And like Don Quixote, much literary fiction in the 17th century formed an independent world of the imagination and did not represent overt religious themes like these paintings. Instead, it played mostly with Italian Renaissance forms of literature and classical moder models of morality. Literature was mostly marginal to church affairs and looked upon as a trivial or a bad influence by clergy. Still Cervantes novel was associated with his, in his critic's mind with uh, reformist ideas. So in the second painting, we can see how the observant Franciscans, which were the branch of that order that adhered to the strictest rule of poverty were using visual art to display their identity. This canvas was part of a series done by Francisco de Herrera for the new Franciscan College of San Buenaventura, which opened in Seville in 1600. Now, regardless of the exact theme of this mysterious painting, it's clear that the two female figures are the leading protagonists, at least it's clear to me. Um, that's my idea that it, it you know, this could be the appearance of the legendary St. Catherine of Alexandria, who was a patron of students to the family of a young Bonaventure who became a theologian in the 13th century. But the naturalism of the painting balances out a sense of a miraculous apparition. And this is a very large and imposing canvas as you will see if you go to the museum. Now, some of the clues as to the theme were inevitably lost when the school ceased to exist in the 1830s. And that's when under a modernizing economic policy, the Spanish government seized and liquidated numerous church properties, including this one. I would speculate that the central role of the two female figures here reflects the great importance of women's patronage for Franciscans in the early 17th century. The school was initially financed by a wealthy widow from Seville, Isabel of Syria, who was married to a Corsican aristocrat. And the development of women's education and the appearance of many women writers in this period are intertwined in Spain with the Franciscan and Carmelite orders, as well as with the public religious events that were financed by wealthy individuals and local groups. These often included poetry contests. So this Franciscan school may have come about as a response to the Jesuit schools that were everywhere gaining predominance and prestige. The Jesuits were overtaking the earlier cultural leadership of the Franciscans and Carmelites with their new classical curriculum that was effectively edging out these orders and becoming dominant while also marginalizing women because the Jesuits uh, have no female religious branch as the Carmelites and Franciscans do. So the Society of Jesus is really a counter-reformation order founded in 1540 by Ignatius of Loyola. It rose to become the most important force in education in Spain and its colonies during the 17th century. Uh, literature scholars know that literary styles and the degrees of inclusion of women in the period can be traced to the influences of the differing curriculums and access between Franciscan colleges versus the new Jesuit schools, pre and post Trent. So <clears throat> the next painting is of Mary and the Archangel Gabriel at the Annunciation of her pregnancy, which is in Luke in the New Testament. And Francisco de Zuburan, like Herrera, and we learn this from the exhibit, was a successful painter in Seville which as a port to the Americas was the most important economic center in the country. In fact, 
studies of the religious festivals there at the time, like the ones that were held in honor of Ignatius of Loyola when he was beatified and canonized as a saint, show how counter-reformation art served to heighten the prestige, sometimes served to heighten the prestige, not only of the church, but of the business con uh, uh, the business, uh, uh, businesses and patrons that financed it, um, as well as particular groups within the church. So it, I would like to mention another major civilian painter at the time, Francisco Pacheco. He was the teacher to the major um, court painter, Diego Velazquez, who you likely know. Um, and it was Pacheco that substantiated the core values of counter-reformation visual art in his treatise on the art of painting in 1649. Pacheco was also a poet and he was the host of an inter intellectual tertulia um, or a, a kind of salon where painters, writers and patrons mixed. But, but before Pacheco's treatise, it was Zurburan uh, in his depictions of the Virgin Mary, like this one, that were coming out of his busy workshop, who was really defining the prototype of how she would be portrayed by others. And a couple of aspects of her iconography can be, are, are here in this painting. Um, if we observe the celestial light above her, this might be Mary um, as a metaphor for uh, the aurora or the light of dawn. And the basis in scripture for this was the Old Testament Song of Songs, verse 610, who is arising like the dawn, fair as the moon, resplendent as the sun, formidable as an army. And this verse was read at the time by Catholics as an allegorical foreshadowing of Mary's motherhood. And, and this painting was also produced at a time in Seville when there was a profound popular support for the belief in the Immaculate Conception of Mary. This was the belief that Mary, like Jesus, was also conceived miraculously. And there's no scriptural source for this, but it was a traditional belief uh, that dated back to the Middle Ages that came from the apocryphal Gospel of James. And that recounts that Mary's parents, Anne and Joachim, embraced chastely at the city gate in the walls of Jerusalem and Anne became pregnant. So the buildings in the background may refer to this legend. The Immaculate Conception controversy broke out in Seville in 1613 when a Dominican friar, Diego de Molina, stated in a sermon that this was a, just an erroneous belief. Um, and the Dominicans were the Aristotelian rationalist, rationalists following um, their brother, Thomas Aquinas. And, and they were on the side of, against the belief and the Franciscans, Carmelites and Jesuits uh, favored the belief in the Immaculate Conception. And this caused an enormous uproar and eventually the Pope had to intervene now, it didn't become church doctrine until 1854, but for many years, it, it, and it has been intensely celebrated in Seville, um, the first public poetic jousts or contests were uh, dedicate, dedicated to the Immaculate Conception of Mary were held there in 1615. And I think, I think it's interesting to note that these public literary religious events awarded prizes and also local fame, which gave a variety of artists opportunities to position their careers, including women. And for example, in Seville, the playwright Ana Caro wrote uh, secular theater and religious theater. And uh, she also published journalistic reports that were moneymakers of local celebrations. Uh, she published one on a celebration of the Catholic missionaries who had died in Japan, uh, which was held at the Franciscan convent and another public event, which was financed by a local nobleman at the parish church of St. Michael. So uh, women artists had opportunities through the patronage of counter-reformation art. And interestingly, Ana Caro uh, was of an enslaved Morisco family 
and she was adopted into a wealthy family that moved to Seville and became a celebrated playwright there. Also, Spanish women were on stage at the time. So uh, the fourth painting in this series of six is of St. Michael. And he was a popular subject during the Counter-Reformation because the war in heaven was an allegory for the Catholic Church's militancy, just as Michael defeated Luther, Lucifer in the book of Revelation. Uh, the Catholic Church was going to defeat its enemies. And, and you can really see the tenets of Counter-Reformation art at work here. Uh, it casts Christian identity as a polarized battle between supreme good and evil. It gives viewers very technically sophisticated sensorial experiences that endorse the supernatural reality defined by Catholic beliefs. And it offers a, a gripping spectacle that enhanced the power of clergy and church institutions. And this is also a very large and imposing canvas. Jose Antolinas, the painter, grew up in Madrid. And as the exhibition explains, he became one of the most prominent Baroque painters of religious subjects, attracting prestigious clients at the Spanish court. This was a period of public autosacramentales, which were um, religious allegory plays. And they were presented lavishly and at great cost. Ana Caro, the civilian playwright I mentioned, wrote some of these, which are lost. But the most famous author of these was uh, Pedro Calderón de la Barca, the last great Baroque writer from Spain who died in 1680. So in a play like this, you might be in the street watching and seeing characters with names like vanity, idolatry, death, thought, <laughs> uh, playing out uh, moral spectacles. And these were put out in June to, uh, in celebration of the feast day of Corpus Christi, which marks the Catholic belief in the real presence of Christ's body and blood in the Eucharistic bread and wine. So I um, just want to check my watch for a moment. Um, in this next canvas by uh, Bartolome Murillo, we see a, a, another very dramatic, busy, thronging scene um, with an infant's uh, witnessing gaze in the corner here in the left middle corner. Uh, I think it's interesting that Murillo shares with Pedro Orrente, the painter of the first work that we saw, this technique of using beautiful babies to stir up popular devotion. And here we have St. Andrew, known as the first apostle of Jesus, being crucified by the Roman ruler uh, Aegeus for converting his wife to Christianity. So I learned from Nelda that this painting is likely a workshop copy after Murillo's original version, which is now in the Prado Museum in Madrid. And there's many notable features of this painting, which is technically marvelous. But for me, the most interesting is the very clear portrait of a black man working in the center of the composition just before the saint, just below the saint. And at the time that this uh, painting was produced, some 10 to 15% of the population of Seville um, was black. And black civilians were enslaved and many artists' workshops relied on their labor. Uh, you may know of the painting of Juan uh, de Pareja by Diego Velazquez. Diego Velazquez painted that painting, I think in Venice as a kind of a practice for a wealthy uh, clergyman that he was about to, to uh, paint a portrait of. And, um, and now Pareja's portrait, and Pareja was a painter in his own right, um, hangs in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And that was done in 1650. Um, so the, because of the melodramatic details of this painting and the bright color, uh, 
the it seems to me that's that Murillo's stylistic choices are a bit at odds with the counter-reformation theme of martyrdom. For example, the the kind of seeming workers' consultation at the foot of the cross and the slight awkwardness of the soldiers out in front. You know, one is gawking with his horse's hindquarters facing the viewer, and the other is adjusting his flag. Um, it makes me wonder what different effects the charms of this painting might have held for different viewers. You know, it's just a speculation on my part because definitely writing at the time and literary works at the time often held, uh, you know, kind of superficial messages with one reading and deeper, more difficult to discern messages with another uh, because everyone was so guarded. Uh, so it, it might be a nice time to just bring up as a counterpoint to the, the solemnity of counter-reformation themes like this, the, the rivalry among artists and the taste for satirical and burlesque poetry um, that was a way for them to express their, their competitiveness. So the painter Francisco Pacheco, who I mentioned earlier, collected satirical poems and recently one such burlesque roast um, was found among his manuscripts. And it gives us a, a flavor of the sense of humor among artists and poets that frequented these intellectual salons in Seville and um, a sense of humor that coexisted with the production of their fervent religious paintings. So here's a translation of some of the verses lampooning an anonymous clergyman in the city. Quote, from his lectern, this ass teaches preachers how to preach, applauding and flattering anyone who brings him sweets, but braying loudly against those who deny him the contributions he thinks he deserves. His holy place is the church tower, where he goes all the way up to the Geralda to sniff the smoke from the chimneys, deciding from there whom to visit and where to feast. So, that was the, the kind of um, biting criticism that the artists themselves were enjoying um, at the time. And this, this last painting is also by Murillo and it's the, the Good Shepherd and it's a depiction of the child Jesus. There's also a version of this that hangs in the Prado and it allows us to see how later Counter-Reformation painting uh, answers and also had a, had a part in producing um, a taste for sweetness that we might see as uh, anticipating romantic painting. I think Murillo anticipates a preference that will continue. Um, and here, the earlier Christ-centered mysticism of the 16th century, which was very serious um, and defined a kind of Baroque way of thinking and composing that brought the human and divine together, uh, becomes something different. It's, it infuses, Murillo infuses an idealized uh, kind of rustic rusticity with a, with a kind of soft and holy sentimentality. Um, with the ruins in the background. So, you know, just, I think that the Prado version of this painting is dated at 1660. So about 12 years before the 30 years war in Europe had come to an end and particularly the, the war between France and Spain. And so in 1648, Spain starts to really clearly cede its dominance in Europe to France. And this continues over the next half a century. Um, and in 1700, we have the end of the Habsburg monarchy with the death of Charles II uh, and the entry of the Bourbon monarchy into Spain. So the rulers and the fashions changed. Um, this is a time, I think, of a parting of ways between the two postures that I mentioned at the beginning with the first painting that existed in the Counter-Reformation. The, the one which was really sure of humanity's centrality in a material universe became the force of secularization and enlightenment rationalism. 
in the well-educated echelons of society, and it was embraced by the Bourbon monarchy. And traces of the other remained in the cultures of the religious orders and within popular religiosity. But it's interesting to note that the Bourbon monarchy did um, uh, expel and disband the Jesuits in 1767. But the Jesuits in the 17th century in Spain were really responsible for making a shift from theology and classical education to philosophy in Spain. And um, so I'll conclude by leaving you with the words of a 17th century Jesuit philosopher, Baltasar Gracian, who was very influential um, in Germany because he was later admired by Arthur Schopenhauer and Friedrich Nietzsche. And at the close of this period, he really represents a kind of secularizing tendency. And he describes how to live well in the culture of crisis in which he lived. This is maxim number 229 from Gracian's Art of Worldly Wisdom. You should parcel out your life wisely, not confusedly in the rush of events, but with foresight and judgment. Life is painful without a rest, like a long day's journey without an inn. What makes life pleasant is a variety of learning. So for a beautiful life, spend the first act in conversation with the dead. We're born to know and to know ourselves and books faithfully turn us into real human beings. Spend the second act with the living. Behold all that is good in the world but the third act belongs entirely to you. To philosophize is the highest delight of all. So those, that's, that's the end of my remarks. And I hope that you have remarks, uh, comments, or questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Boltman. That was wonderful. Um, and we do have time now for questions and conversation with those of you in the audience. So if you have questions or comments for Dr. Boltman, you can put them in the chat or you can also unmute yourselves and ask her yourself. Um, and I can help sort of moderate questions in the, in the chat box. So I, I see one already from Mary asking, what is the central theme message that viewers should take away from this exhibit as a whole? So um, uh, Dr. Boltman and or Nelda might be able to comment on that. Yeah, I think Nelda probably. <laughs> well, I can comment on the art historical <laughs> part of this. So um, I think, I don't know if some of your students are in among the participants, uh, Dana, but as I brought up during some of the tours I gave is that this allowed us to discover uh, Seville in 17th century because a lot of these artists worked, either were born in or worked in Seville. So uh, the fact that Seville was such an important city in Spain at the time was because of the port, because of the commerce, because of the Americas and this the trade and the money it was bringing in. So uh, it was kind of a fluke when I made my selection of these uh, wonderful paintings, I wasn't thinking of Seville. It was kind of more as I went into the research uh, that I, it had this common thread. So uh, I think for me as the curator, um, also because I specialize in Italian painting, I often talk about Italy, but uh, you know, we tend to forget Spain or maybe, you know, I do, but has a, has the a really important empire, some, you know, uh, a very wealthy empire, politically important, uh, economically important, and so I'm really glad that we're able to offer this to the visitors because we don't have these works in our collection. So this is also something very important for me. So maybe the takeaways are the fact that Spain was a, a very important cultural hub. Uh, there were a lot of exchanges. Oriente went to Italy. A lot of these artists went to Italy. And, you know, again, coming back to Spain and bringing what they've learned. So kind of this is a snapshot of 17th century Spain. And uh, the other thing I will say 
because Dana, you brought up a little bit the, the question of attribution. So that's always a tricky thing in the sense that you will have seen some of these have been labeled workshop of, and you know, it is very hard for me anyway, although I've looked at the previous research uh, and I don't wanna diminish the quality of these works, but it would be very interesting to be able to compare versions. So the version we have here with the version of the Prado in Madrid. And uh, most of the times you're able to answer if you don't have a proof, like uh, archival proof, a contract or letters of correspondence between the artist and the patron then what you do is essentially you base your, um, you speculate based on formal analysis. So if I were to see the St. Andrew that we have here and the St. Andrew and the Prado, maybe then, you know, any doubts would be, um, would, 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 would be gone. And the only reason why sometimes art historians write that about a workshop is maybe we don't have solid evidence, especially in the case of versions. But the fact that there are multiple versions out there, uh, maybe by the master and then the workshop does not mean that the master didn't have a say in it in the original composition, of course, or how the versions were carried out later on under his supervision. So those are very little tricky things, uh, but that, that's more the art historical thing. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that that I was I was attempting to give everyone a sense of the variety of positions within uh, Counter Reformation Catholicism and also outside of it within Spain at the time that these works were being produced. So that you know it was a time of the Inquisition. It was a very violent time. Um, Spain was uh, involved in all of its. Um, colonial exploitation, and there were many polemics and controversies. Uh, religious orders had different identities. Even within religious orders, there were uh, conflicts. St. John of the Cross, for example, was imprisoned by his own brothers <laughs> to try to, re because he was trying to reform them. So that when we just think of the conflict between Catholicism and Protestant faiths, we maybe forget about the diversity within the Protestant faiths and regions and within the Catholic regions as well. And that diversity is very interesting. And, uh, it, it, and I think um, that's what I wanted to show in my presentation. Great, thank you both so much for your answers. Um, we have a question from Woody McCree and, and, and Woody, you're welcome to unmute yourself if you wanna okay. ask it about Eche Homo. Can you hear now? I just unmuted. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, that uh, piece was very lively and a lot of color, but I noticed that the, the, the steps, both the columns and the steps going down um, were completely dark. And then at the base, you had some of the crowd, very animated, sort of reacting. And the light was dappled on their clothes, like even their arms and their gestures. But the, but the, there's almost like, a zone of, of pure black where the shadow is almost unmitigated. It's like there's no gradation. Um, I just, it was very striking and I don't recall seeing that as a compositional device like I, before. Um, I'm just wondering if that's just a thing of that particular artist or? Well, I think that painting is 1610. I think if I, if I remember, <laughs> but uh, yes, you are correct in your observation because uh, two things to remember. One thing, uh, Ogente went to Italy and in 1610, they will have had experienced the Caravaggio wave. So uh, the, that way of painting of Baroque artists, of the contrast of light and shadow, dark and light, all of that was the, was the result of you know Baroque painters and Caravaggio taking it to the extreme. Now Oriente more specifically went to Venice and he was influenced by um, the Bassano family of artists. And uh, 
And actually, when you see that painting, but I think you understand it even from the slide, and Dana touched on it a little bit, but there's a lot of Titian and Tintoretto and Veronese in that painting because it's very theatrical mm -hmm. and it's yeah, very dramatic. Yeah. And, and like he said, like yeah. all these lines and the crowd, of course, lends itself to that kind of energy, you know, but also the lines uh, for sure. But yeah, that contrast, I think, is the 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 lessons that uh, Oriente learned in Italy, but, um, and so you see that because the Baroque promoted by Caravaggio, you know, is essentially 15, 90, 16, 10, 16, 20. So he's right in there. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sure. There's um, another question about why did the young male saints look so feminine? And, and, um, you know, I was thinking in looking at this question about the canons of male and female beauty in the 16th and 17th century. And I think that they were very different than our current canons of kind of hyper masculinity and hyper femininity that we might see on TV. You know, the, the, um, a young man was considered, you know, before he uh, had his beard was considered to have feminine qualities um, from in classical art as well. So um, I think there is a, an, I think there's an interesting kind of androgynous char uh, character to the uh, Virgin in the Zurboran painting as well that isn't in the, the Zurboran version that um, we know for sure is by him. I, I think I think that femininity was considered uh, more beautiful, but I'm not sure if it wouldn't be associated with a young man. You know, I know I don't know if it would be associated necessarily with with femininity. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that theologically, angels had no gender, so. Um, both Michael and Gabriel were genderless beings. And, and uh, also it was believed that, uh, or that, that the soul has no gender. So it's interesting that women were very oppressed by the Roman Catechism of 1566 that uh, defined, for example, women's role in marriage and purpose to produce babies and things like that. Um, yet there was this idea that that was just a worldly arrangement, that women's subservience to men was just a worldly arrangement. And um, upon reaching heaven, that kind of hierarchy would disappear. So that's my best answer to Jean's question. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Dana. Any other questions before we wrap up? I have a question. Uh, Dana, thank you so much for the presentation. I was uh, looking at the uh, canvas uh, by Antolines. There was the battle between good and devil. And I was uh, thinking if, uh, you know, in, 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 in Peru, uh, there are representation of the good and evil that have the indigenous in the band of the evil. So I don't know if it's happening the same in Spain, if you know the more is, the more, the more people are represented in that way or uh, the Lutheran uh, movement in the side of the evil. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think one thing that's really interesting in the ex exhibition, Jorge, is the discussion of, um, or at least in Nelda's presentation to my class a couple weeks ago, the discussion of Zuberan's paintings going to, um, to Peru. And the fact that obviously there were indigenous painters in the workshops. Um, the, 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 the paintings that seem to me to be the most racialized in Spain are the ones that show St. James the Moor Slayer and, and particularly show dark skinned um, Moors being, you know, killed by a, a white saint. And I, I think that there's other versions of St. Michael that, that 
definitely show a kind of racialized difference between the two figures, but this one doesn't. Um, so that would be that would be interesting to trace um, for sure. And, and in terms of of Protestant paintings, I have I really have no idea. Maybe somebody else who's present. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you, Dana. I just put a link to that painting below too. Um, um, did you have something to add, Nelda? Sorry, I didn't mean to I see there's another question from Mary. Yes, Mary's asking, how do the exhibition's design strategies work to enhance the audience's understanding or interpretation of these artworks? Uh, yes, that's a good question. So we have a great team of preparators or installation designer, designer, I don't know what to call them, people who save my life and make me look good. And so we work together. Uh, what was interesting with this exhibition, just like for the drama and devotion of Baroque Rome, is that I wanted to um, create a dramatic lighting. So Robert, our light expert, uh, if you visit the show in person, you will see that the paintings are lit, you know, very directly, and but the rest is quite dark. And so this, again, is to incite contemplation and kind of go back to um, the sentiment of piety and meditation. So the lighting in that room is, uh, <laughs> you know, m different than in other galleries that we have, but that was very deliberate. I mean, you could still enjoy the paintings, you see them, but it creates an atmosphere. And the other thing also we did for this show was to have all text uh, in Spanish as well. So we have, um, the, the intro panel, the introduction panel, and the labels that are in both in English and in Spanish. So hopefully we, we can, you know, seem more accessible and reach out to more audiences that way. And, and Mary, to go back to your earlier question, one thing that these paintings do is it, it would, it's interesting to stand in front of them and think, do they uh, make you use your intellect, your logic, and your reason? Are they trying to teach you something about um, religious doctrine, uh, the Bible, or belief? And then measure that against the way the paintings maybe move your emotions um, or create a sensorial effect, uh, which is what Woody was mentioning about that first painting, because I think what's notable is this real interest in creating sensorial, almost scientific-like effects that would then create emotional responses um, and supersede the, the intellect or the rational way of, of perceiving the action of the painting. That would definitely be a very Baroque quality in my, from, in my view. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Dana, and thank you, Nelda, for, for being a part of our talk today. Thank you all for um, those of you in the audience for being with us today. Um, I'm going to put a link um, in the chat for info about the exhibition you can find online. Um, the museum is open to the public, so you can come see the show in person. We're open Thursday through Sunday currently, and you can book free time tickets on our website. So thank you all. Thank you, Dana, so much for sharing your, your expertise with us today. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Have a good afternoon, all.